First, I just want to apologize for any mispronunciation of all of these crazy, crazy animal names. I am, I'm not good at pronouncing easy words, let alone Hey, welcome back to Curiosity Hub. I'm Ollie Hubbard. This is week seven of our 12 week marathon experiment. If you missed the other weeks, they're just up there. And don't worry, you didn't miss week six. Um, I just injured my thigh and the videos had kind of gotten out of sync with the weeks. So this is actually week seven and I've had about a week long rest to try and recover my thigh. So this is the first major run since, um, since I heard it. So 20 kilometers today, just gonna take it really slow and hopefully the thigh holds up. So we'll see. <sighs> Made it. Um, I'm gonna have to put some ice on my thigh because it is a little sore, but 20 kilometers down, a little bit of walking, but I'm just happy that it's obviously healing um, and hopefully soon we can get back into the scheduled kilometers. So the other week when we were in Melbourne, we went to the Melbourne Museum and I really, really recommend it. Their exhibits are fascinating and just so well put together. But one thing that kept jumping out at me and was really standing out was the pentadactyl limb. So you probably know it, it's the idea that our arms, our legs, our limbs have a similar structure to all tetrapods. So all tetrapods, which includes reptiles, amphibians, mammals, birds, have a variation of a pentadactyl limb. So this blows my mind, that my leg has the almost same structure as this huge Momentosaurus that was walking around up to 160 million years ago in what we now call China. Or the Quetzalcoatlus Northropy, which was flying above America 70 million years ago. Or my cat. I mean, all of us have this pentadactyl limb. And with that, lately I've been asking, well, what was that common ancestor? What was that common ancestor that gave us this common structure? And it turns out Melbourne Museum had a corner of their exhibit dedicated to this question. And so I've done some extra research to try and understand it, but we're going to have to go back 460 million years. So it was in the ocean when fish first split into two main groups. The first was cartilaginous fish. So they had skeletons made of cartilage and they went on to produce things like sharks, whale sharks or stingrays. And then the other group was the bony fish. So they had skeletons made of bone. Now, 20 million years later, so we're now at about 440 million years ago, the bony fish split off and they became the ray finned fish. And the ray finned fish have fins that are basically webs of skin supported by rays or spines. And you'd be forgiven for thinking this was just all fish because they make up almost all fish from tuna to seahorses, um, just everything that you would normally think of when you think of fish is a ray finned fish. But there is another group, the lobe finned fish. So the lobe finned fish, rather than having rayed fins, have more, they look more like stalks and they protrude out from the body and they look pretty strange, but within that is actually the beginnings of the pentadactyl limb. Importantly, the ancestor of these two groups most likely had gills, as well as simple sacs that could have acted like primitive lungs. 
Now in the ray finned fish, these simple sacs seemed to have become the swim bladder, which is a gas filled organ that many fish have today and it helps to control their buoyancy. But in the lobe finned fish, they seem to retain these primitive lungs and that might even explain why or how they managed to come to land a few million years later. Now that progression is actually shown by the museum as well and they represent it through a selection of different animals that symbolize or represent their genus. So to start we have the Euthenopteron. They lived around 385 million years ago and were purely aquatic. Their lobed fins clearly held a distinct humerus, ulna and radius at the front and at the back they had a femur, tibia and fibula. They were also one of the first fish to have an internal nostril which connected the nasal sac onto the palate. A necessary step towards animals that could breathe as well as smell through their nostrils. Then the Tictilic, about 375 million years ago. As well as having the funnest name, the Tictilic had a primitive wrist joint, allowing greater flexibility of the front fins. This, as well as stronger rays at the end of the fins and a more robust rib cage that protected its primitive lungs, suggest the Tictilic could spend more time at the water's edge and was not fully aquatic. Unlike most fish, it also lacked bony plates in the gill area, which provided its head with greater flexibility. Then, about 365 million years ago, was the Ancostiga. It had more pronounced digits, but it was still primarily aquatic. The Ichthyostega was around during a similar time, but it seems to have had stronger ribs, vertebrae, shoulders and hips, although we think it was still largely aquatic as well. Now the next chapter, from about 360 to 345 million years ago, has remained a mystery for a really long amount of time. Just due to the lack of tetrapod fossils from this period, it's even been called Roma's Gap. But as we are finding more and more fossils, that gap is continually shrinking. And most of those fossils are coming out of Scotland at the moment. For example, Pedipes, a 348 million year old creature. It had front facing feet. So we currently think this little guy or girl was one of the first fully terrestrial animals. Although the structure of its ear suggests its hearing worked best underwater, so it still could have been swimming around a bit. From here, the amphibians, reptiles, and then mammals all branch off over the next tens of millions of years, and the birds branch off from the reptiles. But all of them hold this similar limb structure due to their common ancestry. But hold up. What about whales? Whales are mammals and they definitely do not have any kind of legs. Well, the Melbourne Museum actually had some awesome fossils to help explain this. And it's, it's awesome, it's really interesting. The only reason that we can trace back the likely ancestry of whales is because of the structure of their inner ear. So around 50 million years ago, a dog-like animal walked the shores of a shallow sea in Pakistan. It was a mammal and as you can see, it had the pentadactyl limb. Now this fossil was found in that same sea dating to about 49 million years ago. It belongs to the Ambulocetus, which was likely a fully aquatic mammal. However, it retained the terrestrial limbs of its recent ancestor. But without the need for load-bearing limbs that allow walking on land, the selective pressures of the aquatic environment can be seen in this fossil from just 40 million years ago, the Duryodhon. Clearly the hind legs have shrunk in the last 9 million years as the animal became more efficient and specialised for its aquatic environment. It's also starting to look more like a modern day whale. This process continued for a very long time and today we see a massive variety of whales. But let's look at the blue whale. At the museum they had a pygmy blue whale and have a look right there. The remnants of its ancestors hind legs and its front flippers clearly show the structure of the pentadactyl limb. 
So whales are actually a perfect example of how common structures exist because of common ancestry. Now, I think it's important to remember that our understanding of evolutionary history relies pretty heavily on the discovery of fossils that are really, really, really difficult to find. So this area of understanding is always developing. In fact, those lobe-finned fish I was talking about before, one group of those are called the coelacanths, and they went extinct tens of millions of years ago. Until we found one in 1938. I mean, we thought they were extinct, and then we found one. So just imagine everything else that's still out there. But I mean, my mind is still blown by the fact that my leg has the same structure as this dinosaur because of this fish. Crazy. It's, it's, wow. It's crazy. Well, the thigh held up perfectly, so I think we're back into the schedule. Um, yeah. So just really, really hungry. Back to normal. 32 kilometers today. The, my thigh is a bit tight, so hopefully that gets better as I start running. Um, but yeah, just gonna give it a shot, take it nice and slow, and try and finish the distance. So, wish me luck, 32 kilometers. Well, I've done seven and a half kilometers, but my thigh is hurting again, just like when I first heard it. So, I think for long term recovery, I'm just gonna have to stop here which really sucks unfortunately it looks like the 32 kilometers is gonna have to happen next week uh, just gonna have to really prioritize getting my thigh back to good health and uh, just back to normal really so that's frustrating but nothing we can do and on a positive note I would just like to say a massive thank you to Sophie Jordan and S Fisser from the Netherlands your generosity towards the Against Malaria Foundation um, is just awesome um, we've actually got we have 20 nets, 6 nets, 12 nets, so we have 38 nets already. That is honestly over 38 people who are being protected from malaria because of your support. So thank you so much for that. Uh, if you want to check it out, I'll put the link down in the description. Um, but thank you for your support. Uh, feel free to subscribe if you haven't already, and as always, stay curious. Thanks. Ha, ha, ha.